Welcome everyone to our video on heat, temperature, and molecular motion. In this video, we are going to describe the different types of chemical systems, and we are going to compare the different types of energy found in those chemical systems. There's going to be a lot of new language in our thermochemistry unit and a lot of new terms. And so this video is primarily a video on some definitions so that we've got some clear language to use when we're describing energy in chemical systems. When we're dealing with chemical systems and we're dealing with energy exchanges, it's very important to describe where the energy is coming from and where the energy is going. So in chemistry, when we use the term system, that's referring to the chemical substances under study. So think of a chemical equation, okay, a reaction. Uh, that chemical equation, those would be the chemicals under study. Now, those chemicals might be found in air, but the air molecules aren't involved in the reaction, so they're not involved in the system. Or more commonly, those chemicals might be found in water, and the water is more of a medium, and they're not involved in the chemical reaction as well. So the system are the actual chemicals that are undergoing the change. And then when we use the word surroundings, that literally means everything else. And I don't mean uh, everything else um, directly surrounding the uh, chemicals, I mean everything else in the universe. Those are our surroundings. Now we're gonna be taking measurements in the surroundings right close to the system at that system surroundings barrier. But when we talk about the surroundings in chemistry, that is everything in the universe that is not the chemical system. Now when we have chemical systems that are usually undergoing a chemical change, that's usually what we're interested in here, there are three types that we can have. The first type, and I'll start from the right here, is an open system. An open system is one where energy can be exchanged. So heat can flow out of the system or into the system, or light can flow out of the system or into the system. But matter can also flow in and out of the system. A lot of the experiments we've done in chemistry involve open systems. Think any sort of reaction where a gas is produced and we do a um, a splint test for um, hydrogen or oxygen. Uh, well, we're allowing the gas to escape into the surroundings. So that's an open system. A closed system is more commonly used in chemistry when we're really interested in understanding energy changes. And the reason for that is in a closed system, there is no exchange of matter. Ma only energy can pass through the system surroundings barrier. That's important because if you allow matter to escape, all matter contains energy. So for example, with a gas test, if you're allowing gas particles, particles to escape into the surroundings, those gas particles are carrying some of the energy of the, uh, of the system of the chemical reaction with them. And so you're losing your ability to track and to measure that energy. So a closed system is often important when we're studying energy exchanges. An isolated system is one where neither energy or matter can flow between the system and the surroundings. You may have been introduced to different types of energy in, say, a physics class or an earlier science class. You might be familiar with some of these terms, but what's important here is that we are applying these types of energy to chemical systems, okay? I'm awfully, often going to be using analogies to help us think about some of these forms of energy because once again, that's one of the difficulties with chemistry is that we're talking about um, energy that's held within things that we can't actually see like chemical bonds. Our first type of energy is potential energy. Potential energy in the context of chemistry is referring to the energy that's stored in those attractive forces within a chemical substance. Our first type of potential energy is the nuclear energy. So that's the energy that's holding the nucleus together. And this is an immense amount of energy that's held uh, in a single nucleus relative to the size of that nucleus. Moving out a bit, we have our intramolecular potential energy. 
those intramolecular forces are the covalent bonds or bonds within the chemical substance itself. And moving out even further, we have the intermolecular force of attraction, which when a substance is in the liquid and solid state, they are the forces of attraction holding molecules together. When chemical systems undergo different types of changes, we're tapping into one of these different types of potential energy. So a nuclear reaction, that's tapping into the potential energy stored in the nucleus. When we're undergoing a chemical change, that's tapping into the energy stored in the intramolecular forces of attraction. And when we're undergoing a physical change, that's tapping into the energy stored into the intermolecular forces of attraction. Just like in physical systems, kinetic energy, or capital E with a subscript K, is the energy of motion. And the kinetic energy of a substance is directly related to its Kelvin temperature. Within a chemical system, there are four primary types of kinetic energy. The first one is electron energy. Those electrons are whizzing about, about the nucleus there, and they have kinetic energy. Not too important for a lot of the things that we're going to be discussing, uh, discussing uh, in this unit. Vibrational energy is the energy that's found in all states of matter, and it's the type of uh, kinetic energy uh, that when a substance is in the solid state, it's the only type of kinetic energy that it can undergo. And that is because those particles are fixed in place and all they can do is vibrate. So they can their bonds can stretch together, they can stretch in opposite ways, um, or they can bend slightly as well. But they're all fixed in place during this time. If the intermolecular forces between molecules are weakened enough, that chemical substance can also undergo rotational kinetic energy. And that rotational energy is when those particles are rotating about an axis around each other, and that's found in both gases and liquids. And our final type of kinetic energy is translational energy, the movement of a particle from one point to another, which can only happen in gases because they have overcome those forces of attraction between the molecules and allows them to move in straight lines from one point to another. The type of energy that we're very interested in is the internal energy of a chemical substance. And that that term internal energy is simply the total amount of energy contained within a chemical substance. So it's potential energy plus it's kinetic energy. Now a term that's often used interchangeably and we will use it interchangeably as well is thermal energy. So internal energy, thermal energy, we will use those terms interchangeably in this course. Now that we've described the different types of energy within a chemical substance, let's clarify and compare two common terms that are often misused. In chemistry, when we use the term heat, heat is referring to thermal energy in motion, okay? It's the internal energy that's being transferred from one chemical substance to another chemical substance. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of a substance. So we take all those particles and take their average kinetic energy and that gives us our, its temperature. Let's relate the two now. The relationship between heat and temperature is that heat or thermal energy always flows from a system with a higher temperature to one with a lower temperature. So that summarizes our introductory video on heat and temperature. In our next series of videos, we're going to get into how we actually measure these things in chemical systems.